So what I'm going to cover is we're going to go through two cases. Um, and as we know, mitral insufficiency can be graded as primary or secondary MR. And I'm going to go through two cases of functional or secondary MR that can be compared and contrasted and actually go quite well together. I have no competing interests. So this is the Carpenter classification, which you know uh, classifies the MR according to leaflet motion. So type one is normal leaflet motion. Type two is excessive, where you can get with prolapse and flail, and type three is restricted leaflet motion, where um, which can occur with ischemia, LV dilatation, and you know rheumatic bowels. Um, in terms of type two and type three are mainly primary MR and type one is secondary MR where the actual leaflets themselves are not that abnormal and their motion is generally normal. The problem is either top or bottom of the valve is either the LV or the LA that's causing a, uh, an issue. So case one, uh, we have a 77 year old male, history of atrial fibrillation, congestive heart failure, has had previous bypass to obtuse marginal and a previous mitral valve repair with a small band three or four years ago. So now he's come back and he's presenting with left main osteum stenosis and severe MR. He has no known allergies and he's on some heart failure medication, beta blocker, uh, antihypertensive and a statin. So this is our four chamber view and uh, the board denotes note that the RV function looks normal, starting on the right side. The LV doesn't look quite normal, but it's, uh, it's mildly reduced, but the valve leaflets themselves uh, don't look thickened or calcified, and they seem to be meeting in the middle. If you want a bit of color on the mitral valve, you can see that there's a clear failure of coaptation, and there's a large central jet uh, that's hitting the base of the atrium. Just a bit of color on the tricuspid and there's a bit of trivial TR there. Here we've measured the annulus. So the annulus is ideally measured in the mid esophageal long axis view. So the upper lip and our normal is 3.6 centimeters. Here it's 4.7 centimeters almost. So it's, it's quite dilated. And again, wrote, Scanning through the valve, you hear at the commissure level where, you know, it's quite normal to see the appearance of two jets, but it's just the, 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 the scan is cutting through it twice. Here at the, the two chamber view. Now you can see the uh, mitral valve, uh, again, small leaflets, the ventricle less than normal, but there is an abnormality just at, you know, north of the valve leaflets uh, on the left side. If I point to it with my arrow, that's probably the old band, which seems to be misplaced and not doing what it was supposed to do. I'm doing a bit of color on the jet again. You can... And then moving to the three chamber view, mid to long axis. And this is the ideal view to measure the vena contracta. The 3D on fast view gives you a nice uh, view vision of the coaptation plane. And you can do this with TT and TE. And if you look carefully, you can see the band at the, the level of the posterior leaflet, but it's not extending from fibrous trigone to fibrous trigone, as you would expect. Here's some color and you can see that the, the jet looks quite severe. But again, my colleague will talk about the limitations, the pros and cons of jet area in the next talk. So we've measured the vena contracta here. It's at 0.505. Uh, centimeters, which um, is in the moderate range according to this, but 
with the grading mitral regurgitation, it's important to not just have one measure, but you have to, you know, look at jet area, flow convergence and the vena contracta. So it's multiple parameters before you can decide whether it's mild, moderate or severe. Just a couple of points on vena contracta, just to refresh your memories, it's the narrowest portion of the regurgitant flow that occurs at or immediately downstream of the regurgitant orifice. It's characterized by high velocity laminar flow. And it is slightly smaller than the anatomic regurgitant orifice. The cross-section area of the vena contracta represents the measure of the effective regurgitant orifice area, which is the, you know, the measure of lesion severity. And it is independent of flow rate and driving pressure fixed for a fixed orifice. And compared to things like jet area, the, the vena contracta by color is much less dependent on technical factors. So it's a good semi-quantitative measure. So like I said, uh, it's a 2D measurement. Uh, and if the 2D measures less than 0.3 millimeters, it's considered mild and greater than 0.7, it's considered severe. There's a table by Zogby for the 2017 guidelines, which again, look at a, multi, uh, a number of parameters, including LV size, the MB morphology, the color flow jet area, the flow convergence, and then some Doppler sets. We'll look at some of these in turn. What they have included there is uh, something called tenting height. So this is the maximum distance from the leaflet tips to the annular plane. And if it's greater than 1.1 centimeters, it means you should replace the valve. This is the only time you say that mitral valve replacement is better than repair. And the repair will fail because of the ventricular remodeling. It's also a measure of the degree of tethering of the leaflets because of the, you know, uh, abnormal size of the ventricle. Here we have a pulmonary venous flow on the left upper pulmonary vein, which shows systolic blunting of the S wave, which would imply at least moderate MR. And again, good practice is to try and evaluate more than one pulmonary vein to get a better, uh, more accurate uh, measure of the, of the mitral regurgitation. You may not see it in one vein, but you may, need, may see it in two more. So what they've done here is they've tried to measure the radius of the PISA. And again, it's, PISA is not something I regularly use in, in my practice because that could, we could do a whole 45 minutes on the pros and cons of PISA. But here they've measured the, the, the radius of the PISA, 0.65. Guidelines say that if the blood pressure is 100 to 120, any radius greater than one centimeter implies severe MR. And it's indispensable to, to have the, the flow convergence, the vena contracta, uh, and the jet area in uh, as linear as possible when you're, when you're making your measurements. So this is a, this is a transgastric short axis view of the left ventricle, which shows that again, that it's not quite normal and it's got some left ventricular hypertrophy associated with it. Again, and this is the same ventricle at 90 degrees. So looking at all those images, it's easy to characterize that this is a mitral regurgitation secondary to annular dilatation. So what did the surgeons find? The surgeons found that the posterior leaflet was restricted when they went in. Uh, the old band had not gone from the fibrous trigone to fibrous trigone. In fact, the band was seven millimeters away from the annulus, actually in, in the left atrium. So the plan they made was to remove the old band, band, put in a 29 size Hancock valve and do an LED bypass. So these are the post bypass uh, images. And you can see that the, the valve is in place. There's a little bit of air that you can see um, just coming off pump. 
leaflets seem to be opening well. Put some color across it, there's no residual MR. Just scrolling through the valves that you can see that uh, everything looks fair. And the LV function doesn't look as good, but that's, that's normal coming off pump initially after one of these operations. Uh, putting some Doppler across, you can see that the mean gradient across the valve is, is three millimeters, which is encouraging. And here, now that you've, uh, you've got another 3D on fast view of the, the Hancock valve, showing that it's uh, functioning quite well. I don't have a color one. But going back to the vena contractor, just some tips and tricks for our fellows. Um, again, like I said, keep the flow convergence and jet area as linear as possible. Have a zoomed view to minimize me measurement inaccuracies. You should position your size and position of the box should be adjusted to focus on the region of leaflet coaptation, not necessarily the entire regurgitation jet within the LA. You also want to keep your color flow sector as narrow as possible to maximize lateral and temporal resolution and have your scale setting about to about 40 to 60 centimeters per second. Like I said, the, the mid-esophageal long axis view for the vena contractor avoids cutting the coaptation line obliquely and potentially overestimating the width of the jet. Classical MR is generally hollow systolic, but you can get an overestimation um, when it's not. And you would have that in situations like mitral valve prolapse, which where you get a, a late systolic. Uh, so it's important to, to time your, uh, your vena contractor measurements with, with your jet. Other things that affect the vena contractor width is the geometry of the orifice. So with primary MR is associated with a, a nice circular um, you know, uh, flow of convergence. But in secondary MR, it's more semilunar or elliptical, and that can lead to underestimation of your, your vena contractor. And this is a, a 3D uh, cartoon which shows from the 2017 guidelines, which show two cases uh, evaluating and quanti quantifying the vena contractor area with 3D echo and multiplanar reconstruction. Uh, Primary MR is the upper panel, and it's got a circular VCA and a hemispheric PISA. And the secondary MR is at the bottom panel, which shows an elliptical VCA and non-hemispheric PISA. And it's, it's thanks to 3D echo that we have discovered that the regurgitant orifice is often crescent-shaped in secondary MR. And in, some, in such cases, the assumption of circular orifice geometry inherent to being a contractor with may result in underestimation of the secondary MR. In, an, in a recent study, 3D vena contractor area of greater than 0.4 centimeters squared denoted severe MR. However, the studies relating to 3D VCA to outcomes really haven't, haven't been performed yet. So I'm not an expert in, in 3D echo, but uh, some points is that it's useful for VC area. It's more accurate for the EROA than 2D being a contractor width. It's useful for multiple jets of differing directions, uh, which, we, which is a limitation of 2D VCW. Um, but it has to be measured offline by reorienting your images and cropping your planes. And to find the smallest flow area can be difficult and tedious because small errors in measurement can lead to large percentage errors. And again, from the 2017 guidelines, this is a, a nice table that summarizes the, the, the technique, the examples, the, the pros and the limitations of 3D echo. And I would highly recommend this paper. Moving on to case two. So this is a 66 year old male with long-standing atrial fibrillation, congestive heart failure, non-obstructive coronary artery disease, so it's mild, and uh, no allergies. And again, he's on some uh, ramipril, spironolactone, fruzamide, metoprolol, apixaban, and mesomoprazole. So 
this uh, this series of images that uh, I'm going to present are from the pre-op echo. So this is a patient who's who's having conscious sedation as opposed to a general anesthetic, and I'll illustrate why later. So you can see that there's this is the four chamber view, and again the um, one thing you might notice is that the left atrium looks absolutely huge uh, just on that view alone. You have at least a moderate regurgitation jet. Again, normal looking valve leaflets. And again, this is zooming in on the valve uh, itself to check the coaptation. Rotating again through the commissura views and the two chamber view. And you can see, it's hard to appreciate uh, the significance of that jet, but then when you actually compare it to um, the intra-op echo, which, which is coming up, I'll, um, you, you'll see a big difference. So here's uh, a 3D view, it's not oriented very well, uh, but just shows that there's no abnormality in the leaflets themselves. And Color flow Doppler on color 3D shows that there's a mitral jet coming through there centrally. This is the pre-op TTE, um, which shows, again, highlights the, the size of the left atrial chamber. So you can see that the left atrial end systolic index, end systolic volume index in the two chamber view is 57.5 um, mils per meter squared. The normal range is 34 mils, and anything over 43 uh, is severe. So now, in this slide, you're seeing the, the pre-op TEE versus the intra-op intra -op TEE, and this basically highlights the effect of loading conditions. So the grading of MR severity can be significantly impacted by hemodynamic changes, particularly blood pressure. Uh, hemodynamic variation can be seen with conscious sedation during TE, but it's very challenging in the operating room brought about by anesthesia and vasoactive agents. So you, you commonly encounter uh, intra-op decrease in loading conditions or contractility. And it, as is highlighted here, leads to an underestimation of your MR. So if this guy had no echo pre-op and was just coming in, uh, we, you know, it's very likely that we may not comment too much on the mitral regurg. Um, so this is why in functional MR, we judge on pre-op TTE. And if we're looking for pathology, we look at the TEE. For primary MR, there's not that big a difference. So this is the, yeah, uh, the intra-op TE uh, 3D on fast view. And again, if you compare it to the previous, the, the regard jet even on 3D doesn't look as, as impressive. Um, this view highlights the annular dilatation again, a healthy four centimeters. So what's the difference between case two and case one? Again, both are annular dilatation, normal leaflet motion, but the first case was secondary to ventricular uh, enlargement. This case is secondary to atrial enlargement. And this happens in long-standing um, atrial fibrillation. Surgical findings, they found a moderately dilated left atrium, um, minimal myxomatous changes in the mitral valve, small leaflets. When they say small leaflets, they're saying small leaflets relative to the actual annular size and gross annular dilatation. So, the decision was to repair with a simplicity band 56 millimeters long to the posterior mitral annulus and do a maze procedure, cryoablation to the posterior wall and the dome of the LA to actually treat the AFib. So post-op, you can see that the, the mitral valve has been repaired. The posterior leaflet is fairly mobile and the anterior leaflet is coming up to meet it and there's no further mitral regurgitation. Again, 
there's very little gradient across the valve. And this is a nice 3D on fast view of the, the band, which if you compare it to the first case, you can see that the fibrous trigone to fibrous trigone connection by the band is, is pretty intact. So this is atrial mitral regurgitation. It's, it's due to atrial myopathy, uh, which is solely due to longstanding um, atrial fibrillation and left atrial enlargement. The ventricular dimensions are generally normal. And this uh, occurs in five to 6% of cases of functional MR. The proposed mechanisms include posterior mitral annulus displacement, tethering of the leaflets, and some have suggested that inadequate mitral leaflet remodeling can also contribute. And most of the time, these cases do not come to the OR because they're treated with, uh, they're treated by treating the rhythm and the rate. So non-surgical therapies and catheter ablation therapies. This is a paper by Silbiger um, in 2014, which uh, highlights the, the pathophysiology. So you can see the normal disposition of the mitral valve apparatus on the, on the left. The, the leaflets rest just at the level of the annular plane, which is uh, shown by the purple dashed line during systole. And in AFib, uh, which is uh, caption B, you can see the left atrium mitral annulus dilatation displace the posterior mitral annulus above the crest of the left ventricle inlet, pressing the posterior mitral leaflet against and leaving little surface of the leaflet for coaptation. And then this distance between the papillary muscle and the posterior annulus increases, leading to the posterior leaflet tethering in the MR jet. So my two MCQs is, which of the following is a functional cause of mitral regurgitation? Is it mitral valve endocarditis, dilated cardiomyopathy, mitral valve prolapse, or rheumatic mitral valve disease? And the answers should have become clear throughout this presentation, but you know, through this session, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll have figured it out. And then the following are indications of severe MR. So systolic flow reversal in the pulmonary veins, regurgitant fraction of over 60%, Sorry, the, the question is the following are indications of severe MR except. So systolic flow reversal, regurgitant fraction of greater than 60%, EROA of greater nuclear 0.4 centimeters squared, or being contracted diameter of greater nuclear to three millimeters. Thank you, there are my two cases. Uh, thank you all for an excellent talk. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Dr. Ansari? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Stop, Stop sharing. Put on your video now. Okay. Uh, I don't see any questions on the panel. A quick question for you, Blah. If if you do a 3D vena contracta, uh, if you have two like two vena contractas, do you add them up or do you just take the largest one? If you did a 3D, I think this is one of the. The limitations that to do, first of all, you have to do it offline. And uh, again, that's laborious and tedious. And you have to do it for individually for each uh, MR jet. But I, as far as I know, you don't add them up uh, and you treat them individually. 